Thank you. Well. You're, uh, you're, you're so good, I'm not even going to charge you tonight. Excuse me. Yeah. Are you and Tommy going I somewhere I just looked together? over there. <laughs> we look like Ray and Bob Everly. <laughs> Why didn't you check with me before the show? We could have found out what we're wearing. They told me there was only one outfit like that. <laughs> I have no retort. That's just damn funny. <laughs> One outfit, nice brown outfit, and we got it. The ties are almost the same. Yeah. Christmas? Yes. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be one of those nights. Is yeah. there a full moon? Oh. Close to it. Close to it. Anyway, it's a nice. didn't I see this group scalping tickets to a cockfight a few weeks ago? <laughs> You make up for last night. Oh, yeah. I do not, like I've said this before, I do not like to discuss previous night's audiences. <laughs> but they're gone. <laughs> it was just not a nice group. The kind of an audience would call up UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick and ask her if she'd pose as a Playgirl magazine as a hunk. You know the kind of audience? You're very close to them. Remember after the monologue? We finished the show last night. The audience comes up and says, okay, that's over. Now what do we do for fun? Not a fun <laughs> You have anything else? <laughs> so far, you, so far, you're way, way up on me. I should point out that Tommy, this is not Tommy's regular job. You know, he has a side job. Tommy rents himself out as a, as a suit tree. Uh, in other words, he'll keep your suit in shape when you're not wearing it. He just walks around. And I shouldn't kid Tommy because I found out some things that his childhood was not... Well, it was, it was a tragedy. There was a mix-up of babies <laughs> in the hospital. But the hospital caught Tommy's parents and made him bring the other kid back. Most of you, I suppose, are from uh, out of town. <laughs> now that the Christmas season is over, the stores aren't so crowded. You can walk around without all the people and everything. You should go into the city of Beverly Hills and just look around. It's fascinating. And especially, even the church in Beverly Hills. Have you been there? St. Francis of Aguchi. <laughs> uh, uh, I... I worry about a church that has a section for video rentals. I don't know. If, uh, it's a very, it's a nice church, but a very, uh, a hip church. Uh, instead of bingo, they play the silver screen edition of Trivial Pursuit. I mean, come on, let's face it. Communion wine is normal, right? But a happy hour? Will I? No, no. Will I get... <laughs> I won't get letters on that, right? Done in the spirit of fun. Uh, it seems like a lot of people are leaving uh, Reagan's, uh, the inner circle, the cabinet. Uh, the uh, interior, uh, Mr. Clark has left. Uh, Michael Deaver, you know who Michael Deaver is? He is the, the deputy chief of staff and one of Reagan's closest friends. Announced that he is leaving. But uh, the reason is, working conditions for Michael Deaver have been very difficult. Three times a week, the president calls him and says, Mike... Did I tell you about the time I was driving down the Pacific Coast Highway? <laughs> and Mike says, that's enough of that. Uh, famous birthday today. Now, I bet there's not one person here who knows the name. Gideon Sunback. That's an actual name. Do you know who Gideon Sunback is? It's true. It's in the paper. He is the inventor of the zipper. Now, there, that's an important man. Uh, they were going to name the invention after him, but 
it sounded stupid to say, hey, your sun back is open. <laughs> What's he? Gideon Sunback. Yeah. I mean, he invented the zipper. Now, when you think of it, the invention of the zipper was... The timing was perfect. came as a great relief to mankind. It was a coincidence that beer was invented... The... <laughs> No more. Just a week before Gideon came up with a zipper, somebody invented beer. Anyway, when is your book coming out? I keep plugging Fred. Fred, our executive producer, has, or, or is writing, in the process of writing, his autobiography. It's a little down the road. Little down the road. What, what does that mean? Uh, it's not going to come out for about five years. <laughs> no, it's in, he's got some startling Hollywood revelations in there. Fred reveals for the very first time that on Ozzie and Harriet, remember that show? Harriet did not bake her own brownies. <laughs> He's got an entire chapter on December Bride. Remember the 1950s hit, December Bride? It's called The Dark Side of Spring Byington. <laughs> I'm in a silly mood tonight. Uh, hey, we got a great show and a special surprise guest tonight. You... You know him as the Beverly Hills Cop. That's right. We have. That's right. That's right. We have Officer Al Grabowski, who has the beat on Rodeo Drive. Dangerous joke. Uh, anyway, we have. Uh, Fine act we have not seen for a while. Mr. Peter Fonda is with us tonight. We have a remarkable gentleman who is a, a comedian, an actor, a, a director. Charles Nelson Riley is here tonight. And plenty a comedian who's been with us before. A. Whitney Brown is here. And. Tommy I, later in the show, will model our other wardrobes for you. <laughs> Anything else we have? That's it. Oh, we have no. another uh, consumer. A consumer advocate coming up. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, isn't that exciting? <laughs> Listen to them. What, we can see, hear the reaction of this crowd? <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We'll be back in just a second with all of those things. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tommy. Got me in the great NBC orchestra. Thank you. Well, the Christmas shopping season is finally over. Unfortunately, for too many people, they're returning shoddy merchandise purchased over the holidays because of false advertising claims. The Tonight Show presents the following segment to protect the viewing public from any future ripoffs. Here is our consumer reporter, our own champion, the superstar of consumerism, David Howitzer. friends. Thank you, friends. Good evening. I'm David Howitzer, and welcome to Consumer Supporter. If your TV's bad, call me. If your car's bad, call me. If your sex life is bad, don't call me. I've got my own problems. <laughs> Before we start tonight, friends, it's the start of another year. So don't be a New Year's nerd. Don't be a moron in the marketplace. Remember, Shakespeare said it best when he said, all the world's a Kmart. <laughs> or words to that effect. Here's our first consumer tip of the week. Never buy lingerie from a man with a clothespin in his mouth. Now, friends. <laughs> we received quite a few complaints from dissatisfied automobile customers who didn't get the options they requested. Now, one man we know ordered a car with a sunroof. Sounds simple enough? Well, this was what was delivered to him from Detroit. A car with a sun on the roof. That's right.
The dealer's six-year-old boy, Jason. Read those labels. Remember, friends, a good thing to remember is to stick with name brands. For example, if you're purchasing a box of candy, buy Fanny Farmer. Never buy Farmer's Fanny. Now, friends, if you know how to read the universal price code on every box, you can tell whether it says you found a good buy. There's the universal price code, or you'll know if it's a good buy or if you got shafted. <laughs> sure, you got, you got star search. <laughs> I have one show, this is it. <laughs> Don't forget, friends, you're a consumer of government services, too, and you do have rights. For example, if you're stopped by a traffic cop, you can ask to see his ID. You can ask to see his name tag. You can also ask to see his underwear. You'll be beaten unconscious, but you can ask to see it. Now, on the subject of health, here is a medical product I cannot... I cannot. A medical product I cannot, in good conscience, endorse. The combination baby pacifier and corkscrew. <laughs> Obviously too dangerous. Read those labels. <laughs> Speaking of health, how can you tell if the lunch meat you're eating has too high of a fat content? That's easy. Take a slice, draw a face on it, and if the face reminds you of Tip O'Neill, it's too fat. <laughs> now, friends... And friends, remember, be suspicious of any company that sells you pets through the mail. Yes. One viewer forked over $300 for a guard dog. And this is what arrived in his mailbox. A frankfurter wearing a badge. Another thing to remember, friends, is always carefully examine the merchandise. Sometimes a well-meaning manufacturer will mail you a shipment meant for another customer. For example, one of our viewers up in Walrus Tongue, Arizona, <laughs> Mr. Chap Lipschitz. That's right. Sent away for a pair of long johns. Now, they crossed up his order and sent him an item meant for Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger. Instead of thermal underwear, he received thermonuclear underwear. <laughs> Here's a letter here. From June Tuna of Blowhole, Montana. Let's... <laughs> Dear Mr. Howitzer, until recently, my husband worked at the Coleco Company. Last month, he was buried alive under two tons of Cabbage Patch Kid foam rubber guts. <laughs> to get over my depression following his death, I decided to use the insurance money to redecorate the den. I phoned a carpet company and sent them a check for $9,000 for an oriental rug. Boy, did they see me coming. Well, boy, did they see you coming. She was right. This unscrupulous carpet company sent Mrs. Tuna an oriental rug, a toupee made in Taiwan. <laughs> Among the biggest scams we know are those ads that promise you'll look 200 pounds thinner overnight. A, disillus a disillusioned victim of this come on has agreed to join us in person tonight. He sent these con men a certified check for $700 to make him look thinner overnight. And wait till you see what he got in the mail. Will you welcome, please, Mario Humongo of Extra Toe, Ontario? See, the idea here was he's a big man, and they're going to make him look thinner. And so they painted a thin man's suit on this very large man. Thank you, Mario. $200 for that outfit. <laughs> Earlier, we were talking about Cabbage Patch Kids. I'm not giving up. <laughs> You're probably aware there are counterfeit Cabbage Patch Kids on the market. Let me show you the difference. 
This is a real Cabbage Patch Kid. That's right. And this, my friends, is a very subtle, hard to detect counterfeit. <laughs> if you receive one of these, contact your local district attorney. They also try to fake off, palm off, fake off, palm off. <laughs> they also try to palm off a larger version, a fake larger version of a Cabbage Patch Kid. And here is that fake larger version. If you receive this version, do not contact the district attorney. <laughs> Simply ship it COD over to my office. I'll see that it gets my immediate attention. This is David Howitzer saying, <laughs> look for the union label. Read those labels, friends. Just join us. Peter Fonda will be out later. Hey, Whitney Brown. My first guest, you all know, he has been a frequent visitor to our show. He's a very talented actor and director who is currently between jobs. <laughs> Here, usually, as they say, currently, he's directing or he's acting in, but he currently, as they say, is at, I guess, at liberty in our business. He'd come out to plug that. That's right. <laughs> Charles wants to come out and tell you where he's not working. <laughs> Anyway, we hope 1985 will be yeah. a super year. Would you welcome Charles Nelson Riley? <laughs> I mentioned I mentioned you had nothing to plug tonight. Does it feel strange to come on a show like this and have nothing currently to say? No, you're... I usually don't have that much anyway going for me. <laughs> Well, you were directing. No, I like the sketch. You see, you could have fooled me. I sat there with everybody, and we all laughed. It's hard to work without your real hair. You know what I mean? And I thought you did wonderfully. We so thought costuming would help the sketch. Yes, yeah. now, am I in the right segment? I'm comedy, but yeah. more not, not that on-the-nose comedy, sort of like humorous reflections. That's right. And you know what I mean? So Fizzy saying... The orchestra wants to play at any time. Just go right ahead. Yeah. If it doesn't go well, Happy we can New Year. I'm saying to you. Did you, you have a New nice Year? Uh, What'd you do New Year's Eve? A New Year's Eve of... I, 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 I... <laughs> I thought it stopped that and last. You know, I have a friend that owns a good restaurant, and so uh, I always, I always get a friend that owns a good restaurant. And so I went, and I had a wonderful, he had a wonderful orchestra, and we went dancing. I danced with three women, which is rare for me. Why did you? You mean Why all at the same time or what? One, but I don't dance at I all. I see. Well, good. You know what I mean? Uh, do they have? Can I jump in here? Yes. Sometimes I think maybe you're meditating. Happy you New Year. No, like... no. That would be another act at a different time. Right. I do the meditation. But later. you're doing your mentor or something. No. Uh, uh, did what, they... did you, uh, what were you going to say? I was going to uh, ask you. I, see, I never know when you've come to uh, the end of the I know, but it's, it's getting worse year after year. And you've... <laughs> For... 23 years I've been honored to be in this chair. I know that. You know what I mean? And I feel the band might play at any minute, but <laughs> I'll keep going. <laughs> you seem to be a close of one. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Tommy, we're back. Peter Fonda will be out in a little while. Hey, Whitney Brown. And we are talking with uh, Charles Nelson Riley. I haven't seen you, well, since Christmas, of course. Did you yes. get nice gifts? Uh, I got Did you get anything you wanted? No, I didn't get anything I wanted. I got a strange uh, group of gifts. Uh, I, I, seeing I'm a director, I have a lot of friends, but I fight with a lot of friends when I work with them, so I get half is what I thought I would get, because that's what's <laughs> difficult about being a director. You mean if you break up? And, and then it has its good side, because you only have to give half of what you thought you'd give, you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I... Remember when you were a kid and you'd break up with your girl before Christmas, or your... And then you didn't have to? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cheap trick. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, got, I got a vacuum cleaner. You know what I a mean? Vacuum. A vacuum cleaner for my boat, because I always take the vacuum cleaner from home. So I got a vacuum cleaner, I got a stove. What I got did you use before? A vacuum cleaner from the house. And it looks silly to a uh, rugged You mean a guy. stove for the boat? Yeah, just for the boat. Oh. And then I got a stove, and I got a cover for the stove, and a spice rack, and I felt like a bride. You know oh. what I mean? <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with a brown no, outfit? No I linens or anything like that? Nothing like that. Like that. Yeah, and okay. so it was kind of... Uh, but anyway... Uh, well, that's a nice Christmas. 
What's the worst Christmas? Well, I hate to get this. Well, no, uh, 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 I was very poor. Well, you've said that before. Yes, and, and, and we never had too much at Christmas, and it was sad because I was an only child, and I lived with my mother and father in this two-room apartment. And you see, Christmas was when my mother said, Father's getting ready for Christmas, which meant that he would go in the garbage and find the old empty bottles of good whiskey. Empties. Yes. You see what I mean? Then he would come home and he would fill them. You know what I mean? So that when the people came... Fill them with what? With 88 cents worth of the cheap stuff. What? You see what I'm saying? So we had all these big bottles on the bridge table and an inch in the bottom of, 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 the, of the cheap stuff oh. so that we could feel like we belonged. But it didn't matter because nobody came anyway. <laughs> and the thing was, then my father would start to go into the bottles and, and I was like four or five years old, I remember. And then he would decorate the tree, you see. Yeah. And every time he finished the tree, my mother at midnight would tear it down. Now, this is not a... I'm not trying to be funny. Why this at is, midnight? I don't know. It's sort of like Christmas Eve, and it's on the nose, Cinderella, that kind of stuff. But the thing was, it, that's when the tree hit the floor. See, my mother always had this sense of emergency. See what I mean? I, can, I believe that, yeah. Even after I was born, there was this sense of emergency. <laughs> but the thing is, then she came to visit in California years ago, and there was this big pink tree on the, on the Playboy Club on Sunset Boulevard. And we're driving down Sunset Boulevard in a big wind, and right in front of the car, the tree fell right in front of the car. An omen. And I looked at my watch, of course, it's a Christmas <laughs> omen. I looked at my watch, and it was 9 o'clock in California, but 12 o'clock in Hartford, where the famous 12 o'clock tree dismantling took place. <laughs> so it wasn't that a wonderful Christmas. And then I moved in the village when I first went to New York. I had the fortune to move in this gangster territory area, which was, may I say, terrific for excitement, and that was like 10, 12 years of wonderful Italian Good. friends that yeah. I had in the village. So anyway, you'd come home toward Christmas. Did you, did you think they didn't hear you when you said Italian? No, I... <laughs> that was a, a stage whisper, ah, Don. I see. But anyway, I would come home at six, 6 or 7 o'clock at night, and there'd be a man, like, played by Abe Vigoda, leaning against the building. And he would say, Canned ham. So you'd go up, I lived in 2B, and you would go up to Marie, who was in 3C. Yes. And she had on the floor of her apartment cases and cases of canned hams. <laughs> then you'd get three hams for like a dollar. Right. And the next night you'd come home and he'd be leaning against the building and he'd say, leather goods. <laughs> <laughs> a better day. So you'd go up to Marie... <laughs> You'd go up to Marie and you'd get a couple of wallets for 50 cents because the stuff had to get out by right. the next of course, shipment. Of course. <laughs> then if you came and there was like a line halfway between the second and third floor waiting, you knew that it was appliances that day. <laughs> you see, so you'd get, you'd get your, you know, get some stuff good. But that was a wonderful Christmas feeling, fun. you know, because friends wouldn't go shopping. They'd just come down with me and then it'd either be a ham or a bologna or you might get an Italian sweater. You never know. You never knew about it, it but it was, was a good fun. day. Yeah. Then one of the Christmases, is it still time? Time for what? I don't know. No, you can go right ahead. <laughs> this, one, of, one of the Christmases I remember was when my first Christmas I was on the stage. How old were you? 14. Right. What happened was, I, no, I was 16. No, I was 14. But I hate people that write biographies that said when I was seven years old, I wore the red sweater. How can they remember? I was 14, but I was tall, but I was, uh, I was working as an usher because I lied. I said I was 16. So that would make you actually 14. So I was in... <laughs> I was in the second balcony ushering because they didn't want to put me right on the main floor. You know what I mean? Sure. I wasn't that strange either. I don't understand, but I was in the second floor ushering and it was the, the Black Hills Passion Play. Very was, famous. It was very famous. A man played Christ for decades named Joseph Mayer. And they were coming through Hartford to do their Passion Play and it was Christmas and I was ushering in the balcony and it was a terrible storm and the company manager came flying back to the head usher and said two of the men in the company are ill is there anyone who is a young actor that works here or anyone wants to be an actor is there anyone that has any flair you know what i mean well i was up in the balcony ushering <laughs> so i mean i had flair that's flareable enough you know yeah. what i mean i couldn't do sports because i couldn't see the ball but i could get the patrons in the seats so anyway they took me backstage because they you know why they have to have 12 men in the passion play disciples very good but not only that, they do one of the big scenes which would have torn anyone's heart out, the other ushers said, was 
The Last Supper. Yes. You see, you got to have them. And I was the one on the end. So anyway, I came with my suit backstage. I took off my glasses, put on a wig. I had my own hair. It was beautiful. But they put a wig on. And then they put a donkey in my hand with a cord and sandals and a toga. And I couldn't see anything. So they said, just wait until the crucifixion scene and then you'll go on. So, okay, fine. Now, the other usher that was chosen was my friend Schwartzy. Because he was tall, and he had a flair, too. A lot of the ushers had flair. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm beginning to pick up on that. Yeah. So, anyway... It's, it's, oh, it's come. So, anyway, I was standing like this, couldn't see, and I had a palm leaf in this hand. No, a palm leaf in this hand, and the donkey cord with the donkey who smelled worse than the sandals, <laughs> and the toga, and I was 14, lying that I was sitting, going to make my entrance. Right. And the woman said, just go out with the others, and when they yell, crucify him, this, just yell, crucify him. So I went, crucify him, crucify him. And then he was on the cross, this wonderful actor, and the, and the, the, and the, and the effects, the lightning and the thunder. I was petrified. It was so real, because I couldn't see, so it made it look better. You know what I mean? If I could see. <laughs> And I seen it, so everyone's screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And I was screaming, Schwartzy! Schwartzy! <laughs> so they said after I took my toga off, I took my, I put, put the glasses on. Yeah. I want to see the band. Yeah. So, uh, after they took my toga off and the wig off and everything else off and the donkey away, they said to me, you don't have to do it tonight. Oh. You see what I'm oh, saying? Yes. But I, I, it, it wasn't that good a debut, but it was at least... It sounds uh, fascinating, though. Those were how the Christmases went, Johnny. Yeah. Gives you an idea. I just wanted a brown outfit one day with a rep silk tie, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Well, I suppose so. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> My next guest has uh, been with us several times. A. Whitney Brown is here. He has a unique style. Next week, he'll be appearing at the Punchline in San Francisco, and he'll be seen on a new television series on NBC next spring called Television Parts. Would you welcome A. Whitney Brown? Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to 1985. Another thrilling trip around the sun. <laughs> I hate to see 1984 go, though. It was so exciting. The Cubs almost won the pennant last year. Yeah! Well, I'm glad they didn't, though, because that's one of the signs of the apocalypse. <laughs> it's written in the Bible. Ye shall know the end is nigh when the small bears from the windy place take the flag. <laughs> but we're at peace the whole year, more or less, in this country. And that's great. I guess nobody wants to mess with us anymore since we put our foot down in Grenada. <laughs> Maybe it didn't take a lot of strategy to knock over a fruit stand with two aircraft carriers, but... <laughs> it's the thought that counts. And it started a wave of patriotism that's gripped this land like a pit bull on a chuck roast. <laughs> We have every right to be proud of where we are. Look at this country, the world's greatest location. An ocean view on either side. <laughs> to our north, Canada, in case we ever run out of natural resources. <laughs> to our south, Mexico, in case we ever run out of people that'll work for 10 cents an hour. <laughs> it's the kind of place you could kick back, raise a few families. <laughs> personal vision of the American dream. <laughs> it's a proud place to be, too. And a kind of place you can live in peace, not like those war-mongering, land-grabbing Russians. Boy, do they seem uptight. <laughs> of course, look where they are. They're in Russia. <laughs> it's got the world's greatest piece of real estate. <laughs> on our west, we have Washington and Oregon, where picnic tables and redwood fences grow on 300-foot trees. <laughs> To their west, they have Germany. It's a nice country, Germany, but let's just say they get a little restless every 35 or 40 years. <laughs> to 
To our south, we have Florida. To the south of the Soviet Union, China. That doesn't make you a little paranoid over a billion nearsighted drivers ready to race over <laughs> gridlock the traffic for a thousand years. <laughs> to the north of the Soviet Union, nothing is to the north of the Soviet Union. <laughs> south is to the north of the Soviet Union. <laughs> And if at times the Russians seem a little edgy, perhaps it's because they share the same landmass with India. That would keep me up late at night imagining what 750 million ravenous vegetarians could do to your potato patch. <laughs> On our southwestern border, we have the great state of Arizona. It's a veritable paradise if you happen to be a piece of petrified wood or an aging Republican living in a trailer park. On the south... To the southwest of the Soviet Union is the wonderful country of Iran. 75 million... Freaks. And if you don't think they're mean, just ask any of the one-armed shoplifters over there. And on top of that, the Russians are now up to their furry little hats in Afghanistan. That was a brilliant military move. Some genius in the Politburo decided they need a little more barren territory. They couldn't restrain themselves at the thought of so many yak herds and impoverished villages right to the plucky. So five years and 115,000 troops down the line, they are now the proud owners of three blocks in downtown Kabul. <laughs> they probably thought, we'll move in, we'll take over. Whoever heard of a Muslim holding a grudge? <laughs> Economically, the Russians have been hurting ever since the bottom dropped out of the Tundra Moss market. <laughs> Their leading export is cultural talent. Everyone defects from the Soviet Union. And who defects to the Soviet Union? British homosexual spies. <laughs> and we're now starting arm stocks, but I don't care. To tell you the truth, I'm not afraid of dying in a nuclear misunderstanding. I think the whole threat's been blown way out of proportion. I have a feeling our descendants will look back at the entire brouhaha in a few generations and laugh their feelers off. <laughs> and you know something else? I would almost rather die as one of three or four hundred million people than I would die alone in the gutter somewhere. But then, I'm a people person. <laughs> Peter Fonda has made uh, 30 films, and he's currently starring in the NBC television world premiere movie, A Reason to Live, which will be on Monday, January the 7th, from 9 to 11 p.m. Would you welcome, please, Peter Fonda. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah. Welcome Man, board, it girl. has been a long time since I've seen you. Too long. Yeah, you're looking wonderful. I thought it was something I said the last show. <laughs> you look like a happy man. I mean I'm that. a happy man. You look uh, contented, and I remember uh, you had a period in your life... Uh, where I wasn't quite so contented you on weren't the contented, show. yeah. You were, you were kind of going through that uh, lifestyle, and uh, now I think you've said that uh, you look out on life and say, eat your heart out. Something like that. Was, was that a, well, almost a quote? That's a close quote, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a broad quote, but it's a close quote. You see, I moved close to Blowhole, Montana. <laughs> Now, you used to live on... Weren't you on a boat for a while? Yeah, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, Charles... Yes, we were on this beautiful boat. Tartouche. 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 Watch Tartouche. Tartouche. Now you got a ranch? 
I have a ranch uh, 40 miles north of the Yellowstone Park on the Yellowstone River. Oh, that's got to be beautiful. And it's very common. Uh, Montana is the fourth largest state in the Union with a population of 782,000. So yeah. there's buku space. Yeah. They say and uh, Blowhole is actually up in Canada. It's near the border, but it's not Wasn't uh, the late Cleet Roberts? Uh, not Cleet Roberts. Um, what am I thinking? Chet Huntley. Chet Huntley. Yeah. Very big on Montana. Mm -hmm. Big sky there. in Montana, which yeah. is fairly near my ranch. And, uh, of course, Mike... M <laughs> letting the air out, letting the air out of the sketch. <laughs> and you told me not to fool around. Wow, oh, that's. You tell me not. Don't, don't fool around when you get out there. You bring okay. that sickness. That that period, you would you get tired of those inevitable comparisons, which everybody seems almost uh, unavoidable to ask you about. Your, you know, you either turn out to be uh, Jane's uh, brother, or, uh, Hank Fonda's son. I mean, those comparisons along the line. Uh, yeah. Well. They're bound to happen. I mean, you know, everyone has a father and a mother. Yeah. So biologically speaking, I'm Henry Fonda's son. That's no problem. I'm proud of that. Yeah. It's just not my identity. That's true. Everybody's so, got to have their own... Uh... And uh, I think I've done pretty well to establish myself uh, as who I am. I don't know who I am, so I think I've done yeah. a pretty good job of establishing great... myself yeah. <laughs> who I am. I mean, yeah. I've been able to go sailing for 128,000 miles and sail only. i have living in a ranch in Montana. I'm still capable of... Uh, doing all the things I did when I was 24. Yeah. Uh, Are you basically a loner? If you had to decide, describe yourself, more uh, of a private I'm a basically I'm an I'm an actor, you yeah. know, and uh, that makes me not a civilian, and that makes me uneasy around civilians. Therefore, people it's always to be alone. Yeah, people always assume that actors, by the nature of the work that we do, or appearing in front of the cameras all the time, are gregarious, outgoing people, and it very often turns out not to be the case. You do your work, and you kind of retreat back to. What is uh, what you're comfortable with? That's right. That's, that's right. I, however, I was able to have some very nice places to retreat. Uh, yeah. You know, going to Montana, going to the boat, uh, and when I was a youngster, growing up, and not knowing that there was a problem being Henry Fonda's son. Yeah. I got to go to some interesting spots in the I'll world. Bet. Christmas in Detroit's great. <laughs> and it's rather interesting. Hey, it's, right. it's rather interesting. The movie you're doing is about a father-son relationship. A reason it's to live, true. right? And uh, when I read the script, John, I was so thrilled with it because uh, I felt that it had uh, good substance to it. And right. Rick Schroeder, who's uh, co-stars with me, he's such a fine young actor. Right. I really got along well with him and enjoyed working. It was perhaps one of the most the most fun I had in, yeah. uh, since maybe The Hired Hand, which was back in 1970. Did you? Did it parallel in any respect your relationship? Well, no, but there were certain things that I could draw on from my own uh, family background. Uh, there was suicide in my family, and a lot of, and several of my friends uh, had killed themselves. And I play a person who has become so depressed right. that he can't see the forest and the trees. I mean, it's yeah. lost. It's like. Uh,
Xin chào các bạn và hôm nay bên em lại về một chiếc Kia Merlin số sàn sản xuất 2007 chiếc xe có chiếc xe màu xanh thì màu này khá là đẹp form rất là nhỏ gọn nói chung là về mua về trên mua trên nắng đi tập nói chung là rất là ok giá chỉ chưa đến 100 triệu các bạn ạ chiếc xe biển Hà Nội nhá như chúng ta đi vòng quanh xe để xem tổng thể chiếc xe xem như nào chứ nhìn phần đầu là có vẻ thấy rất là ưng rồi 30A 40830 nhưng không kể đi ở nội thành mà đi những chiếc xe mà nó nhỏ gọn như này thì rất là đẹp rất là dễ dàng nhìn từ xa chúng ta có thể thấy là rất là ưng rồi từ màu sắc cho đến nhỏ gọn mọi thứ không hiểu sao những phụ nữ rất thích đi những con xe nhỏ gọn 
Còn như tôi tôi cứ phải đi những sòng xe dài Phân khúc hạng D Tôi thích những loại đấy nhưng mà Tầm tiền dưới 100 triệu thì đi những dòng này cho nó bền Những dòng này bánh có những con xe hoành tráng làm gì đúng không Một vòng quanh C Nhưng chiếc xe có chiếc xe màu xanh nước biển Rất là xanh nhạt Rất là đẹp Kia một linh Đời trên trong Nếu keo chỉ mọi chi tiết vẫn còn ngon các bạn ạ xuống cấp theo thời gian 2007 nó rất xuống cấp rồi đây gương kính thì chỉnh điện nếu keo chỉ xe thì nó gần như là còn nguyên đấy bạn ạ mỗi tội là xe này thì hay đi bị bị sức sơn hơi nhiều 2007 nó cũng va quẹt nhiều đây nếu keo chỉ có bốn cánh thì vẫn còn nguyên tuy rằng nó cũng đã sức sơn rất nhiều rồi va quẹt móc méo nhiều nội thất bên trong đây những chỗ đinh tán bấm này thì không thể nào mà làm nếu mà va chạm thì không bao giờ làm lại có thể đẹp như như này các bạn ạ cái này các bạn xem kỹ thì các bạn biết ngay xe đâm đụng nặng hay không các bạn biết ngay đây tôi sẽ cho các bạn xem phần máy máy móc thì 2007 nó nhưng nó xuống cấp nhìn nó rất là xấu nhưng mà đi thì mình vẫn đóng hơn trăm cây vẫn thấy bình thường chả vấn đề gì cả ốc biếc vẫn còn ngon nhưng trên tầm chưa đến 100 triệu thì cũng không đòi hỏi được quá nhiều rồi các bạn ạ đấy là nói thật không thể đòi hỏi quá nhiều cho một dòng xe mà dưới 100 triệu được và nói chung cái xe không bị bung máy không bị ngập nước là ok rồi đây về hàng ghế sau thì xe 75 chỗ mà hàng ghế sau rất là ổn Trần thì còn mới thực ra Trần xe nào cũng mới vì là có ai sầu Trần bao giờ đâu đây xe thì nó cũng xuống cấp được thời gian rồi không khen đẹp làm gì nhưng mà từ cần số đến mọi chi tiết của nó còn được với tầm tiền dưới 100 triệu nó sẽ mua xe máy thì cũng chẳng không không, không chưa mua được con SH đẹp cơ rồi là mua ô tô thì chỉ được con như này thôi tuy nhiên là những dòng mô linh này rất là bền mình ít tiền thì mua những dòng bền này mà đi điều hòa thì rất là mát lạnh luôn cần số còn nhìn rất rõ Nói chung là xe thì đấy từ cái DVD nghe, nghe nhạc nhiếc nữa là ok volume thì căng đét đó nói chung là chiếc xe quay quay tổng thể thì cũng chỉ được như thế thôi và chiếc xe này bên em giao bán với giá là 90 triệu có thể uh, thôi nói chung là bớt cho bác bán một triệu có nghĩa là lọc lá cả đường xa còn 89 triệu bao rút hồ sơ xe đã rút hồ sơ cầm về tay rồi và chiếc xe thì bên em bao là có nghĩa là cam kết là không máy là máy móc và không ngập nước máy móc không bị đâm đụng vào phần phần máy còn sức sơn thì rất là nhiều nói nhanh như vậy cho nhanh ai mua liên hệ với em có số điện thoại em để góc trái màn hình xin chào cả mọi người
Thank you.